It takes teamwork to treat a patient. And the University of Pretoria School of Healthcare Sciences provides the knowledge and skills that enable you to be part of the treatment and care process, even for a potentially life-altering condition. Nurses take care of patients from the moment they're admitted, as in the case of an incomplete spinal cord injury, where special care is required. From positioning the patient for X-ray imaging to reduce the risk of complications due to immobility, this daily regime continues all the way through to rehabilitation. The radiographer uses ionizing radiation for imaging of internal structures as a key diagnostic tool in different medical disciplines. They may also provide support during surgery. The images produced assist in proper diagnosis and the treatment plan required. Dietetics focuses on preventative, promotive, curative, and rehabilitative aspects of human nutrition. In hospitals, dietitians design a specific diet to facilitate the process of treatment and recovery. The patient's nutritional status is assessed, monitored, and optimized through special feeds. Physiotherapy focuses on physical rehabilitation to optimize the functional ability of the patient by means of joint mobilization and improving muscle strength and functioning. The rehabilitation program enables the patient to move independently. In this case, through strength conditioning, patients gain mobilization from their wheelchairs and ultimately are able to walk again. Occupational therapy aims to assist people with loss of function due to disability to optimize independent and optimal functioning in occupations across their lifespan. Occupational therapists enable individuals to perform activities of daily living and provide adaptations, assistive technologies and home modifications. If you have a passion for healthcare and want to change lives, the School of Healthcare Sciences in UP's Faculty of Health Sciences can prepare you in your journey. Our academic programs are embedded in research that matters. Become a life changer and put your commitment into practice. Good afternoon to our viewers. Thank you for joining in. We are really privileged this afternoon. We are going to talk about women as agents of Ubuntu philosophy during COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Pumulani Mavis Murauzi. I'm currently the research chair of Ubuntu community model in nursing. And I'm also a professor at the University of Pretoria. I will be moderating this session for today. Indeed, the philosophy of Ubuntu is the philosophy that is known by the majority of us because that's the way that we have been socialized. The word Ubuntu comes from the aphorism in Guni language, which says, Ubuntu, Gumuntu, Ngabantu. And it means that a person is a person through other persons. I am because you are. You are because I am. I can only be a person because of your existence. And I think during this COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen how Ubuntu was implemented in our societies. And today, this afternoon, we just want to share with you some of the uh, issues and all the activities that were going on that women were involved in. I have the panel of five women, and the first wo woman that is going to talk to us is Tina Power, who is an attorney at Alt Advisory. Tina is going to talk to us about humanity and the freedom of speech of women. I would like, Tina unfortunately couldn't be with us this afternoon. So we are just going to listen to an audio that she has sent. And I just want to say, Tina, the stage is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tina Power and I am a researcher and analyst at Alt Advisory and an associate at PowerSing Inc. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this wonderful 
and meaningful event. I have no doubt that the topics and themes that will be discussed will lead to better understandings and further conversations and actions relating to the role of women in such challenging times. I apologize for not being able to come and address you live today, but fortunately, given the wonders of technology, I am able to share some of my thoughts and ideas with you. I would like to spend the next few minutes discussing issues pertaining to humanity, women, and freedom of expression. As a legal practitioner who works in the human rights space and digital rights space, I will be approaching this topic from a legal lens. I would like to begin by providing a brief overview of our legal framework, highlighting the importance of freedom of expression. I will then turn to address some of our contemporary challenges that we are facing in terms of freedom of expression, particularly online. Here, I will highlight that the existing barriers to accessing the internet and other digital tools have been compounded by COVID-19 and in many ways have deepened gender inequality and have entrenched the discrimination of marginalized and at-risk groups. I will then conclude by sharing some positive examples with you of how women in the spirit of Ubuntu have found new and creative ways to use social media and the digital environment as a tool to advance freedom of expression. To begin, and very briefly, it is necessary to note that South Africa is a constitutional democracy. This means that the constitution is the highest law in our country. Our constitution recognizes our humanity in a variety of ways, from the acknowledgement of our inherent dignity, to the principles of non-racism and non-sexism, we have expansive equality clauses, and an array of fundamental rights that seek to protect us all as unique members of society. Freedom of expression is an important right and is contained in Section 16 of the Constitution. It allows the media to tell stories, it allows us to receive or impart information or ideas, and it gives us the right to freedom of artistic creativity and academic freedom and freedom of scientific research. Our courts have held that freedom of expression lies at the heart of democracy, noting its value in recognizing the moral agency of individuals of our society and its facilitation of the search for truth by individuals and society generally. While we have traditionally understood freedom of expression in terms of classical modes of communication, we are seeing the global recognition that human rights apply both on and offline, including the right to freedom of expression. We are seeing that many states, particularly in the sub-Saharan African region, are acknowledging that sharing information and ideas online is a popular form of expression, and in turn, some states are taking measures to facilitate access to the digital environment. However, and unfortunately, there are still challenges that women and marginalized and at-risk groups face when it comes to exercising their rights to freedom of expression. We are all aware that as a result of COVID-19, many aspects of our daily lives are moving online. This workshop is an example of that. The gender digital divide refers to the measurable gap between women and men in their access to, use of, and ability to influence, contribute to, and benefit from information and communication technologies, otherwise known as ICTs. While it is difficult to fully determine the extent of the gender digital divide in Africa, there are indications that it is a cause for concern. For example, reports indicate that Africa is the only region with a marked increase in the internet user gender gap. Sub-Saharan Africa, unfortunately, appears to be in line with this continental trend, with over 300 million unconnected women in the region. More recent data suggests that women in sub-Saharan Africa are 14% less likely to own a basic mobile phone and 34% less likely to own a smartphone that can connect to the internet. These statistics are indicative of the deep gender digital divide. This divide has a disproportionate effect on women usually. However, in the context of a global pandemic, the pervasiveness of these issues is significantly magnified. There is an increasing acceptance that internet rights and freedoms are more important now than ever before, particularly considering lockdown, social distancing, and reconfigurations to education systems and economic activities. For individuals, governments, educational institutions, business and healthcare institutes, access to the internet has become crucial it is apparent that the internet 
is a lifeline, not a luxury. Unfortunately, the benefits of digital transformation have not been shared equally, and access, use, and ownership of digital tools are neither equitable nor inclusive. In the context of COVID-19, this means that those without access to the internet face significant challenges in accessing reliable information relating to healthcare and educational materials. The disparity in the use and ownership of ICTs becomes stark when women, children and vulnerable groups cannot access services for fear of being monitored by perpetrators or family members at home. Economically vulnerable members of society who are now expected to work from home with inefficient ICT infrastructure are placed in even more precarious situations. In a time where access to the internet is becoming indispensable to everyday life, those who are unable to connect are isolated socially, economically and politically. Despite these pervasive and serious challenges, we have seen women fight, we have seen women rise, innovate, and find creative solutions to emergent problems. This brings me to my final point. Women have found novel ways to advance their rights and establish new forms of mobilization, solidarity, and support. This is truly exciting, and we are seeing the new ways, the new ways in which Ubuntu can be realized both on and offline. I would like to share a few examples with you, some of which you may already be aware of. The first is the Tupperware text. This appears to have been used during lockdown as a useful means within which to reach out to a friend or family member to seek help against abuse. Essentially, a woman who is being abused at home would simply send a text to a friend stating, for example, that she would like to return her Tupperware. This quickly became a code alerting people to the fact that abuse was taking place and that assistance was needed. This manifested in different ways and with different codes, but ultimately demonstrated the creative ways in which women are supporting each other during times of crisis. The second notable example relates to organizations in Kailiche in Cape Town, who raised funds to provide women with data so that they were able to access the internet, access important information, and communicate and share information. The third example relates to the unprecedented growth of online forums and safe spaces for women and vulnerable members of society to learn, share, and support each other. During this time, I have been part of various groups that have provided a constant source of inspiration and support. And I'm aware of many other platforms across which women have been helping each other. It has been beautiful to see the different ways in which women have advanced their freedom of expression and in doing so have brought the spirit of Ubuntu online. While we are faced with new challenges and emergent threats, and while there are significant barriers to the realization of human rights and freedom of expression online, we have seen new and creative ways of expressing ourselves and supporting each other. Women, as always, are pillars of strength in our communities. And, as always, women find ways to fix problems. I hope this brief presentation has provided you with some understanding of the challenges we face. But more importantly, I hope it enhanced your understanding of how we can nourish our humanity and advance freedom of expression in new and novel ways, which ultimately give effect to Ubuntu in the online world. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Tina. This was indeed very interesting presentation. And I think you have touched so many issues that are critical. More especially when you talked about the digital divide and the way other people are still unable to access the uh, internet. But it's so good to also learn from your presentation that as always women, had to find and create ways of communicating. The Tupperware communication that you have given us an example of is one of those. I also remember that we was, when they said there is lockdown, we were very confused, not knowing how we are going to communicate. One of uh, my siblings had to find a way of teaching our own mother who is eight years how to communicate through WhatsApp. We felt that the phone was enough and she was so excited when we used the video and she was able to see us. But she was one of the privileged ones 
We wanted to communicate to our aunts and all, but due to the issue of lack of access of internet, we're unable to do that. And I think COVID-19 has really shown us as women how we can support each other. The Kaya product that you are talking about of buying others' data, I think that is one of the good examples. Indeed, some of the principles of Ubuntu is collectivism, solidarity, participatory decision making, and indeed the sense of belongingness. I think that is very important. And with me here, I have a panelist who are going to be sharing some of their experiences during this COVID-19. And next to me here, I have Prof. Makuela Nkondo, who will be sharing with you women as agents of change. I will give them a brief time to introduce themselves. I also have Mrs. Maringa, who's, who is with me here. She's coming from Guiani. She's representing the community, and she's just going to share with us how she, they, she coped during this time of COVID-19, when the family really needed her as a, a, a carer during that particular time. And we also have Dr. Duplessy Mosellin, who is also going to tell us about issues of combating poverty and hunger during COVID-19. And she's going to share with us how she really assisted the community of Esteras during this difficult period. Indeed, as women, we know very well that in maternity, in, uh, uh, that we need, life doesn't stop. So there were women who were pregnant during this particular time. There were people who needed care in their homes during this particular time. So Prof Ngunyolu is going to talk to us about maternal health care during this COVID-19. Women are really struggling and we're going to hear from her. So I'm just going to give the panelists just two minutes so that they can introduce themselves before they start with their own presentation. <coughs> I'll start with you, Prof Makubelenkondo. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mulaudzi. I am Olga Makubelankondo, retired from UNISA, but not tired, as I'm continuing <laughs> to supervise masters and doctoral candidates for three institutions. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a great honor to be here. My name is Simpoma Ringa. I am from Guiani, Limpopo province. I work from, for the Department of Employment and Labor as a public employment services practitioner. I am a married woman blessed with four children whom I cared during this difficult time. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mausleen Duplessis. I am a lecturer at the University of Pretoria. Uh, I specialize in leadership and management and I'm also a member of the Institute for Ubuntu Health and Wellness. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Roina Ngunyulu. I am an associate professor at the University of Johannesburg. I'm an advanced midwife, and I'm teaching midwifery at the university. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, the way, for introducing yourselves. I think now I will hand over to Prof. Makuelangondo to just share with us from wisdom, women as agents of change, Prof. Could you just share with us briefly how did w women really cope during this COVID-19? Thank you so much, Professor Mulaudzi. I think the most important thing that we should take note of currently is that the word Ubuntu has its origins in Africa. However, it has already been universalized. Um, in 2015, there was an international conference in Washington, D.C. on education and Ubuntu philosophy. And as we are aware, also, the radio for the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, DERCO, is called Ubuntu. Having said that, 
we do have currently a, an international community of uh, high commissions who engage on the Ubuntu radio. Having said that, for me, the current uh, description of the word Ubuntu means cohesion, harmony, an obligation to care. It is a concept that is also aligned to humanitarianism. Having said so, during COVID, we realized how the pandemic undermined traditional cultures because we know that during our culture, I mean, in our culture, different cultures, universally, when there is death, we have an obligation to care. We have an obligation to demonstrate empathy. However, with COVID, we saw health practitioners globally dying, which means that the kind of empathy, the obligation to care had to be modified. We had instances where we found families unable to reach their loved ones during the most critical, critical times of their lives. The role of women has then been affected in several ways. As carers, we know two things in particular, that we have rituals. During these rituals, which are usually induction, are rituals where women are actually given some kind of orientation on how to manage basic life experiences. Now, having women as agents of change during COVID, I'm going to give an illustrative example of a nurse who died 20 years ago in South Africa, known as Marilyn Lehana. Marilyn Lehana died of Ebola at Morningside Hospital when he was taking care of a patient who had Ebola. She subsequently died of Ebola. And now we are aware that there are several health practitioners, medical practitioners, health nurses, as well as allied health professionals who have already been memorialized. It is important, therefore, for us to contextualize Ubuntu when we deal with a deadly pandemic such as uh, COVID. We are aware, for example, that most of the time there is an indication that nurses exhibit certain practical needs as women. And then also there are certain strategic needs. Those strategic needs, if one is female, means the practical needs are pregnancy, taking care of your household, among other things. The strategic needs are education, as well as ensuring that societal obligations have been taken care of. We are also aware that there is currently a very strong suggestion to suggest that women tend to be their worst enemies. Now, how do women become agents of change? Women can become agents of change let's say during those practical requisites in households or domestic settings where the relationship between a mother-in-law and a sister-in-law has to be cordial, harmonious, there has to be cohesion. The issue related to COVID does not mean that when we have deaths, as expressed during the idiomatic expressions, as we know, uh, Professor Mulauzi, there is a very strong suggestion where they would say, a woman doesn't burn, 
which mean if you are a woman, you have to have the deepest form of tolerance. The threshold for your tolerance must be so profound that even when you experience discomfort, you must not show it. And those are some of the idiomatic expressions that we have to now, uh, you know, uh, explore. Do introspection. If you say a woman doesn't bend, does it mean when we have a COVID situation, does that mean that a woman will not get infected? That means you have to have protective, protective armor, not only in terms of uh, personal protective equipment, but you have to also have the kind of um, you know, empathy, the kind of compassion to treat the next woman as you would treat yourself. That is Ubuntu, the golden rule, which means that Ubuntu is not only a cultural concept. Ubuntu is also a political concept. Ubuntu is also a religious concept because it has spiritual connotation. Having also consideration for the fact that we have had international conventions to try and better the lives of women. We have also have legislation. We are currently in an era where sensitization towards violence against women has been highlighted. It is important to note that as women, if we have sons who are abusers, we have to also ensure that that is not done with impunity. As women, we should be able to assist our children, male and female, to be able to deal with issues related to gender-based violence. That's when women will be agents of change. The other thing that we have to also you know, face, we understand what we call an occult system. An occult system means every nation in every corner of the world has its own superstitions, it's taboos. It's not only one community that has its own superstitions and taboos. I mean, I can give an example that, for example, number 13 in the United States is, is dreaded. So that is superstition. Now, superstition is regarded as vulnerability. If we also unpack issues such as superstition, and make sure that the reality is also entertained. We can be able to be agents of change so that we do not have a situation where we can condone suspicion as well as introduce and enhance mutuality or reciprocal res you know, respect. Because Ubuntu also means respecting the next person. Um, uh, Ubuntu also means solidarity or unity. Having said that, one of the most critical factors in terms of women as agents of change are what we call women's cooperatives. Women's cooperatives are ways in which women, even in the most deprived communities, are able to gather all the resources to be able to empower each other, either in child rearing practices or in economic development or even in literacy. Having all those, we should obviously want to strengthen the existing infrastructure. And that infrastructure that we're talking about is obviously the religious, 
uh, uh, communities, the civil communities, among many others. Thank you, Prof. I really think you have given us food for thoughts. It was really uh, something that I think the viewers have learned a lot out of your presentation. Uh, indeed, you talked about issues of cohesiveness, which is very important. And most importantly, the obligation to one another. I think that is very, very important that we look at things like that. You even took it to the issue of showing how we have also internationalize Ubuntu. It is no longer a concept that is, we are talking about only here in Africa. It is now a concept that people are really talking about and are trying to embrace internationally. Prof, we have learned a lot out of your presentation and I just want to say to the viewers, Prof raised a lot of issues, even civil issues, religious issues, issues of superstition and others. It is the time that you can also start asking questions so that we can also be able to answer those questions as we go to the discussion time. We really, I have seen from your comments that it seems like I've made an omission. I only talked about Nguni language. And I've seen a, a, a colleagues writing about other languages. Motuki motu kavatu. Umunu imunu gavanu. Nangachi vendari motu di motu gavatu. So I really think we, when we embrace this, we will be able to understand <coughs> or we cannot be able to eat when others are not eating. When someone has got COVID uh, next door, yes, indeed, we have to find ways as women as to how do we assist. And here this afternoon, I have Mama Ringa from Guiani. She's just going to share with us Ubuntu, taking care of others, an obligation. That even the word obligation, I don't think is correct because for us as Africans, we don't feel obligated. We just feel it is natural to, uh, to assist somebody, whether it is somebody that is my, my relative, but we are a community. We are one and we believe that munwemutihi autusi matutu, which means that uh, literally translated, one, <laughs> one finger cannot be able to pick up the grains of rice. Mm. You, you need the whole hand to do that. So, Mama Ringa, over to you, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. We are indeed in a very difficult time. Myself with my family, we've been directly in, uh, affected by this pandemic. It was not easy. Seeing your loved ones in pain, it was horrific. COVID-19, it's a talk of the day. You go on media, they are talking about it. As a family, we also got hooked. We get interested. And when we heard that SABC will broadcast a movie on coronavirus, we made time with my family. We watched the, the, the movie together interrogating, asking questions, not knowing that that pandemic will directly impact on us. It was very, very painful. My husband and my second born daughter, they fell sick and I had to drive them to consult a doctor. Upon the doctor's examination, I further requested him, please check them, coronavirus. He gladly assisted, he checked them. We waited on the results. On the 10th July, 2020, the doctor called me to inform about the results. I will say it's a blessing that I was alone in the room when I received the doctor's call. Unfortunately, they had tested positive. I didn't know what to do. 
Of course, I was shaken. It was painful. I had fear. But what would I do as a woman of faith? I just closed my eyes and prayed and said, God, this is too much. I cannot handle it on my own. Then I went and called my husband. I informed him of the bad news. Surprisingly, he received it in confidence. He said, ah, at least now we know that we are positive. So we'll have to make sure that we protect people that we work with, our community, and everyone. It was not easy looking on your loved one, understanding that he's been infected with something which you are told is incurable. The whole world is miserable looking for a vaccine. But by God's grace, I remembered the words of my priest, Father Joseph. He once told me, nothing happens for a, there is nothing like a coincidence in life. Everything happens for a purpose. Those words gave me courage. It gives me courage because deep down in me, I knew that the coronavirus pandemic attacked my family for a purpose. And on that purpose, it made me a brave woman that I am today. So we had to inform uh, the school, the institution where my daughter is attending, and we also had to inform the school where my, team, my husband is working. That was the biggest step we took. And that, of course, you'll agree with me, colleagues, that that was Ubuntu on its own, breaking the news, informing people that you've been infected. Because you know these kind of things, there are stigma attached to it at the long run. But then we decided to care for the people that we love. Ubuntu is being thinking of another person before yourselves. So we thought of the community of Guiani. We thought of the learners that my husband is teaching. We thought of his colleagues. We thought of the teachers that we need to protect them. And we broke the news. And fortunately, uh, we received support. But as a family, you know that you get infected. That's why government, the Department of Health, is encouraging us on social distance. So because, you know, we are close. We are a family. It's a, it's a small unit where we are staying together. So obviously, those that are in the house were at risk. So we then decided to make an appointment to go and see our doctor. Of course, well, it was during that time that doctors had received a, a message from the laboratories that they should only test people who have got symptoms because they are overwhelmed. Then, due to the underlying condition for myself and my firstborn daughter and my helper, we explained to our doctor that myself, I'm a chronic asthma person, with my daughter, and my helper is a diabetic patient. So we tested. And then we went back home. We started now informing our families. We also, my husband also requested that I must inform the other kids. So I had informed them. As a family, we had positively accepted it. But breaking the news to our extended families that was the painful experience because some responded by crying, screaming. They thought my husband and my daughter were now put in isolation in hospitals. So uh, like Tina uh, 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 shared the experience of technology, we had to do a video call to make video calls for families to see that, no, we are fine, we are home. It's just that we tested positive. Then. A few days later, our results for myself, helper, and my daughter, my firstborn daughter, came back. Unfortunately, myself and my daughter tested positive. But thanks be to God, because our helper tested negative. Then I chose to release her. You could see that our helper was so traumatized 
But I tried to cancel her. I tried to give her courage. Then I told her that she must now go home. I will remain with my family. Having seen our families distressed, troubled with the results of my husband and my second born daughter, we agreed with my husband that we shouldn't share with them my result. We shouldn't tell them that I'm also positive because it was going to frustrate them more because they were saying, no, it's fine because you are negative, you'll be able to take care of them. So we just shared the, the, the results of our daughter. How did we support each other? You know, I remember the words of Joyce Meyer when she said, a woman is able to say, I'm okay, whilst on pain. A woman is able to laugh, whereas she's standing in a hot, on a hot plate. And I was able to put a brave face so that my family could be well. I supported my children. I supported my husband. The other two, the four-year-old and the 12-year-old daughter, fortunately, they were not infected. But myself, my husband, and the two daughters, the two girls were infected. The only thing that I did as a mother was to give them all the love, was to pray, and it was not easy. At times, fear would come, anxiety would come. As you know that this pandemic has brought fear in our lives. At times, I will be sleeping, and I'll be dreaming coffins, and I will jump out of bed and call on my husband. And then sometimes I remember that day when he was in serious pain. It was hurting. He just looked at me. I could read his face that he's saying, I'm in pain. But he was unable to speak out because he had a short breath. He was getting tired. And I just encouraged him. No, don't worry, my dear. All will be fine. We'll be back to normal. Just pray. If you cannot speak out, tell God that Father God, heal me in the name of Jesus. That's the only vaccine I could use for them. But how did the community support us? Oh, our loving community, Gian. Our neighbors, when they heard about the news, they were all there for us. They will prepare meals and bring to us. And our priests, they were calling us, local priests, Father Paul, and priests that are far from us. Having heard the news, they called us. The local pastors, they called and even prayed for us over the phone. They made us to feel that it is not our problem, but it is a community problem. There are ladies, a lady who volunteered, she just called and said, we all know there are basic needs that each and every family needs every morning. She volunteered out of love, out of compassion. Every morning she will buy bread, she will bring lemons, she will bring whatever she feels is necessary for us to be having for us to make sure that we don't die in agony. Sometimes she would arrive, stand at the gate, and call that, I'm here, please tell Gabaza to call. Then my 12-year-old daughter, she will run to, every day before she could go to her work, she will make sure, sometimes we'll tell her that, no, as you know that our appetite is not good. We did not finish what you brought yesterday. Say, okay, it's fine. But surprisingly, she'll be at the gate bringing some nice things for the two young kids. What a love. What a woman. A woman who risked her life to make sure that myself and my family will receive something. We also had, we were, we did not have a direct healthcare person. 
to take care of us as we were at home. But there was a dedicated professional nurse who will do the rounds that are done in hospital. She will give us three rounds every day. She will call, check on our conditions. How are you doing? If I tell her something, maybe short breath or tiredness or whatever, she will say, no, this one, it needs a doctor. This one, no, you can do one, two, three, four. Our family doctor, Dr. R. W. Mbiza, what a passion he has for his job. He was there for us. When my husband was suppressed by this pandemic, I called him. I told him, my husband can't breathe well. And he's not a person who's got a, a, this problem of chest. I'm worried. And he's getting tired. He said, bring him to the surgery. I drove my husband. Remember, I'm a woman who also tested positive. But I thank God because I did not have all those symptoms. I was able to care for my family whilst treating myself. And upon arrival, we did not wait. Even the receptionist, she, she, she received us well, showed us the consultation room. People were there, but we just passed. The doctor checked my husband. He said, the oxygen is dropping. He need to admit him. I just looked at his eyes, telling him that, please, don't admit my husband. I will see him at home. I will take care of him. He read my face. He understood. He said, it's OK. You'll take him back home. But should he not improve, tomorrow is admission. It was not easy. But let me tell you, there's no vaccine for now. But the vaccine which I have, we, 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 we have seen, or it has helped us to, to, to recover, is love. The love and the caring that our community and our families shared with us. Let me, Prof, allow me just to share one thing with you. My employer, the Department of Employment and Labor, after reporting to my manager that I've tested positive, I sent him an SMS. Hardly in 30 minutes, the counselor from the Department of Employment and Labor called me to check how I was doing with my family. That on itself, it's Ubuntu in government. The employer who doesn't want me to be productive only, but he wants to ensure that my family's well-being is also well taken care of. And they also reminded me of the benefit that we have as employees of labor, the benefits of counseling through Kways services. I called the Kways services. They contacted us. They set an appointment for a counseling session. They even checked on the language that we prefer to be cancelled on. That was an outstanding support from government itself. How I wish all institutions can have this kind of a support to its employees. I really, we, we, we did feel the pain because COVID was there. Stigma, yes, stigma was there. Not everybody has good knowledge and understanding about the pandemic. There are those people who talk careless when you have disclosed your, your results. But believe you me, we chose not to listen to the negative. We chose to believe that we will conquer the virus. And out of love that was shared to us by our families and our colleagues, employers, our churches, everyone surround, who surrounded us. We, 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 we truly appreciate everything. Munu, imunu, ibawana. You cannot fight the pandemic alone. Fellow South Africans, let us love people. Give them our support. 
and pray for them. Because through prayer, that's the only thing that can give people courage and faith to fight the pandemic. Here we are, not that we are more blessed, but it's the grace of the Lord that has been upon me and my family. And I thank every woman who were with me while journeying in this pandemic painful road. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much, Mama Ringa. I think this was is eye opening. You know, to have the experience and to have experienced that, and you sit here this mo this afternoon and still say, "Thank you, God." You have brought the issue of Ubuntu is also about religion. It's also about understanding God is also about love, compassion. It is also about communal living. You are, you are, we are, not, uh, you are not an island. You cannot solve all these problems alone. And the way your community really supported you, it just shows love, compassion. And one of the tenets of Ubuntu is issues of respect, which is reciprocal. You know, it's mutual respect. It's also about relationships between, you know, people. We have to have relationship and nurture those relationships. And when we have this, obviously, we are happy about that. And also, just to touch back also with what Prof has said, you know, the, the feeling that we sometimes feel re really, according to us, for example, if you are sick, would like to come there in large numbers. But there is COVID, it doesn't allow us to do that. If there is death, we really want to drive home, we come in large numbers. Sometimes I even say, but you are saying grandmother so and so, but I don't even know grandmother so and so. I saw grandmother so and so when I was five, but I have to be there. Because that is how communal living, you know, uh, uh, sometimes exposes us to you know, the love of another. So we really, really appreciate you are sharing with us. And I think they are our viewers, if there are some people who are experiencing the same currently, who have uh, their families suffering from COVID, have realized that the vaccine that we are waiting for is already here. And that vaccine is the love of another. So now we proceed. It takes a village to raise a child. And that is what is always said, it is one of the tenets of Ubuntu. Uh, Dr. Duplessy. Thank you, Pro. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. This afternoon, I, I want to share with you, uh, if we say it takes a village to raise a child. And I'm, that, I'm an example of that child that was raised by a village in the Eastern Cape. And that is one of the reasons when the pandemic struck, I could not sit still. I could not sleep knowing that there are kids outside there, knowing that there are women, there are households outside there who are really uh, are burdened with this COVID-19. But before I go there, I just want to give you a, a brief background of uh, what happened before this feeding scheme actually started. Now, uh, Prof. Mavis have a baby, and we call this baby Ubuntu Community Model in, in Nursing. So what Prof. Mulauzi did is uh, she wants to bring Ubuntu back into the, the communities. And one day I walked past the office and I said to a prof, uh, I, somebody is offering, one in uh, our community members is Nolan Hudsonberg, and he's offering me his place. It is a place a event, he's an event organizer. And prof said to me, but Moslin, I have the idea and you have the place, let's bring it together. My idea is to bring Ubuntu, let us go back into Esteras because Esteras is one of those places that was very, is, is very marginalized. So let's look at Esteras, let's go and see how can we bring back Ubuntu there. 
Let's go look at Mama Lodi. Let's sit together and put our heads together. Uh, long story short, we eventually come up with the, uh, a workshop that we, that, we, that we conducted on the 14th of March, where it was we invited all the stakeholders of Easteris so that we can hear from them what is their needs and how can we help. Um, and also retired nurses. And we have a very fruitful workshop. And you know what happened after that workshop? People were so touched that a group of ladies, retired nurses and also community uh, activists came together. So the person who led that group was uh, Noren Masupi. She came with the idea and say, you know what? Let's aim while the, uh, the, the aim is still hot. Let's run with this Ubuntu. Let's bring it back into our community. And from there on, we started with uh, having meetings together, having all the stakeholders involved. And we started, an in we established an institute for Ubuntu wellness and health. Health and wellness, sorry. So this group of people then said, and that is now in this where we going to the COVID-19 now to shut down. And we, we had our meeting again and say, how can we create a safety net for our community with the COVID-19? And you know, a few hours before uh, we had a national shutdown, we actually established a war room for Easterers, making sure about food security, making sure they will be, uh, be looked after the poorest of the poor. And in that meeting, we invited the stakeholders, all the stakeholders in Easterers. Because when you look at COVID-19, it is a multi-dimensional uh, 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 pandemic. You, if you need to, the, to have a solution, you must have a multi-sectoral solution. So we brought in everybody and said, okay, at social media, what are we going to do? Uh, our Port FM, our local uh, radio station, uh, our stakeholders our, in our sectors, we have 35 sectors in Easterers, our sector leaders. How will they give out food every day? What are we going to do? How? And also our resident doctors came on board. So we had a war room and then we have an institute for uh, Ubuntu Institute Health and Wellness. So where do I fit in? Where do they come in? So I'm a member of the Institute of Ubuntu Health and Wellness. And like I said before, uh, for me, it was impossible to go to bed because I was raised by a village. So what came into my mind is I have to sit down and ask God, just show me how can I help my community? Because if you look at Easterers, Easterers have 6,500 households. Yes, there is a population of 65,000 people. 50% of those people are under the age of 15. Yes, there is, is the, the children cry out of hunger there because now with the COVID-19, you know, COVID has this perfect makings to, for, to make a storm. And in here you find that suddenly there's job losses because of this sudden shutdown. And then you also find there is that freeze of food uh, transfer where you, the kids was used to have a, fee, a feeding scheme at school. Everything is stopped now. So you also look at now, with, because they have this little money, so what is, what is the parents going to do now? They go, if you look at the nutritional density, they are going to look for cheaper and, and it's lower calories. So you are looking now at malnutrition. So all of these ca things came into play. And you know what? I asked and God answered me. I started with a feeding scheme. And but first I did my homework around this feeding scheme. I had to go and see who am I going to serve? What is the age groups? What is the households? And I joined a group 
a, a non profession a, a non profitable organization named mothers on the moves and we i asked them if i can be part of this and i explained to them that in this covid 19 i want to be part of the solution i want to part to be part to help as a member of the institute for ubuntu health and wellness I started with to provide nutritional meals for them uh, every Tuesday since lockdown. And I've worked uh, with Catherine Williams and uh, the ladies there. Thank you very much. Uh, also, Prof. Mulautsi was very instrumental in helping in counter donating money so that we can go on. Uh, the thing here with the kids what happened is that you come there the first day, you, you, you don't know the kids, the kids doesn't know you, and you start giving out food. But as time goes on, we start to know each other, we start to understand each other. So you also come in with telling them about COVID-19, you know. There is education, there's health education about COVID-19. Um, you, you, you look at their background, their granny. So there's that uh, a mutual communication between us. So uh, also on Mandela Day, we, we served by the help of the Ubuntu uh, Institute as the University of Pretoria, as well as, as Prof. Mulautsi. We had a Nelson Mandela Day for those kids we serve them with 150, uh, you know, treats for the day. And you know, the, the non-profitable organization, Moms on a Mission, uh, they then match me with 150. So it's 300 uh, kids that we serve for that day. Um, so that is, that, is, that is how I try to contribute. And, and I'm very thankful for that because Ubuntu for me, as a person, mean ek us, vi ek us, dear Anna Mensa. I cannot go to bed knowing that somebody is in a lack. So uh, it grew very big. The kids started 50. We are now moving uh, to 150. And you know what God keep on providing. They are keep on growing. So if there's anybody out there, if I can ask you something, if there's anybody out there, I need scales, please. Because I have to weigh the kids. Because I have to see whether there was change. Do they pick up weight? <laughs> you know, you cannot just do and you can't measure. You have to be answerable. Okay, because in Ubuntu, we measure, you know? Uh, so please, is there anybody out there with skills? I want to weigh the kids so that we can see in terms of food, are they growing? Okay, and going forward, uh, I will want to invite, if there's any one of Easter's looking at me now, I'm, um, we are in this together. If you have better, more ideas, let's come on board. Let's build our, our community. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so much, Dr. Duplessis. Indeed, you are giving us, you are challenging us. And I think uh, even those that are watching, if you have two cents that is left after you have budgeted, there are kids who need food during this time. And it really touched my heart, more especially when you say there were feeding schemes. So when this feeding scheme is stopped, then it means that those kids don't have food. So I really think it is very, very important for us to understand that Ubuntu is about giving. We cannot be eating, you know. Sometimes we even have leftovers and we say, but these leftovers have been here for a week, then we just put them on a dustbin. There are people out there that really need our care and so on. And I also like the fact that you also are attesting that 
You know, one African speaking colleague once said to me, you talk about Ubuntu, you translate it in many languages, but what is Ubuntu in Africans? <laughs> then I said, nah, it smells like hate. <laughs> So it is good, Moselin, <coughs> that you also showed us that I am because you are in Africa. And so it is within all these languages. And I'm just happy that even one of my colleagues from America, Wisconsin, is also, has also joined this conversation. I saw the comments and so on to show that it is now part of Ubuntu is now part of the global village. Wherever we go, I am now even called Ma Ubuntu because of the way we are trying our level best to you know, uh, talk about this philosophy because we are seeing that if we really embrace this philosophy, the morals that we are seeing, the moral decay that we are seeing around us, you know, the, it will, uh, those things will improve. People will no longer be self-centered and think about themselves that if I get food, then it means that I must eat alone. If I get a tender, it's my tender. It can't be your tender. It must be the community's tender. It must be something that is going to improve the community. Let's start forget forgetting about issues of individualism. That is an African. As Africans, we know that we work in solidarity. We are a collective and we have to have cohesiveness. Indeed, during this particular time, one of the challenges as nurse midwives that we had was we have women that are pregnant at this particular time. They really want to go and deliver, but they are afraid because it is said that there is COVID. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the hospital, obviously you will come back with COVID. Mm -hmm. There are those that had babies during this time. They wanted to take their babies to baby clinic, but we're in serious lockdown. We don't know what to do. Today here this afternoon, we have a maternal health expert. Prof Ngunyolu, Prof, this is your time. Just share with us some of the suggestions that we can do during this COVID-19 in terms of maternal and child health. Over to you. Thank you so much, Prof. I am going to talk about maternal and child care in, during COVID-19. In South Africa, COVID-19 came as a new dawn. Nobody was ready for it. Our healthcare system was not ready Midwives were not ready. Unfortunately, pregnant women were there and they needed maternal services. They were so anxious. This is a new pandemic because as South Africans, we have never experienced this. It is a new experience. Either than countries like Asia, they had different pandemics, they had H1N1, they had MERS, they had SARS. Now when COVID came for them, they used the experience, they used the lessons learned during the previous pandemic, but South Africa, it was our newborn. So pregnant women, life continues 24 hours. They have to go to the clinics, they have to go to the hospitals. Immediately after hearing about COVID-19, the president announced lockdown, which affected issues of transport. When the numbers increases, some of the hospitals had to be closed, meaning that pregnant women had to go far, long distance in order to get these services. And within the transport, they are not sure whether they will come up, up safe. No one was used to the mask. It was a new way of living. They have to cope with that. When they are in the uh, cubicles for examination, only one person is allowed to be in. Some are used to come with their partners. But now, because of this change, that did not happen. During labor, 
Some they used to come with their partners so that they massage them. But during, because of COVID-19, that did not happen. They were not sure whether the babies that they are delivering, they will be safe or not. Even if the expert talk about that the fetus are safe, COVID-19 so far, there's no evidence that the fetuses have been affected or there's a transmission via the placenta. But as lay people, they don't even understand what that, does that mean, but they had to cope with that. When it comes to midwives, they have to practice the issue of Ubuntu, which on, in, the, in other words, it says an injury to one is an injury to all. When the woman is in labor, she needs that touch. She needs that smile. She needs that massage so that she's able to cope with the labor pain. It's not an easy experience. So as midwives, they have to uh, contradict the uh, lockdown measures of social distancing. How will you <laughs> maintain social distancing when the woman is in labor? is in serious pain. So they had to massage, they have to palpate to make sure that everything is fine inside the abdomen. They did not have a choice. Another thing, a woman cannot put on a mask. It's impossible, more especially when she's in labor. They had to cope with that. They showed their caring, their compassion, their love to make sure that the mother and children have that therapeutic experience. As South Africans, what did we learn from this COVID-19? We have learned that as a country, we are not immune to any infection, including COVID-19. We also learned that pre-existing conditions put life at risk of having infections. And what are we doing about it? We need to teach our women. We need to give them health education about health promotion. Once you teach one woman, you taught the world. They must know the importance of exercises. They must know the importance of well-balanced diet. They must know the importance of family planning. They must know the importance of being free from stress. They must know that an injury to one is an injury to all. They must share whatever they have to each other. When you teach one woman, encourage her to share the information with others so that they continue with the spirit of Ubuntu. This is the only way that can assist us to cope with the coming pandemics because this is not the, it's not the last experience is the first one. We don't know what is coming. So we need to continue with the personal hygiene, environmental hygiene, teaching each other and living healthy lifestyles so that we keep our immune system healthy in order to fight against whatever is coming. Because the battle is not over. We just flattened the curve now. But as we learned from other countries, they had what they call second wave of COVID-19 infection. So we must be ready to face that. We must be ready to fight against it. We must be ready to prevent because prevention is better than cure. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Prof, I think we have learned a lot out of this. Indeed, uh, pregnant women were really in a very big predicament. They really didn't know what needs to be done. I think uh, we can now take questions also from the audience. I'm seeing a, a question there that uh, the audience are asking because we are not able to just see it properly. Okay, there are still issues and concerns about infant feeding, particularly breastfeeding. 
how do we support these women to continue breastfeeding even if they test positive? Okay. Yes, Prof, I think that is directed to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Regarding breastfeeding, is the best method that we can give to our babies because breasts have everything. And so far from what we have learned from the ex experts, there's no evidence that the virus can be transmitted through breast milk. Because if we can introduce other type of foods apart from breast milk, we are putting the lives and the health of our babies at risk. So it's better for us to continue teaching each other that breast milk is the best. It has all the advantages. It's easy, it's uh, cheap, it's, we it's well prepared. Unlike a bottle where you have to count spoons of a powdered milk that you put in, for the breast, it's saving everything. The temperature and everything is right. You don't have to keep it, to put it somewhere so that it cools down like you do with the powdered milk. So let's continue breastfeeding our babies, more especially for the first six months of life. That will be the best for their health for now and the future. Uh, thank you, Prof. I really think that uh, breastfeeding is something that we all are trying to promote. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my colleagues was just telling me not long that, you know, one other thing that is very important is that she always heard about uh, six months breastfeeding. And then she thought that it will not really be possible. She has tried it with her own uh, baby and she has seen how healthy the baby looks. So I think we have to encourage women to do that. So I think one other thing that I think is important is also now to have a discussion. Our viewers, we are still waiting for your questions, if any. So what we have seen so far is comments. We have received so many comments, but we have not received uh, questions as such. So if you have got questions, please ask. For now, I just want to ask maybe from my panelists. Uh, we also heard about um, natural uh, remedies that people have been using during this particular period. So would you maybe like to share with us some of the remedies? I don't know. Mama Ringa, what have you used for your family? Because I think it's also very important that mm. we also, uh, th there will be people maybe there listening, wanting to know exactly what is it that maybe Mama Ringa, apart from the mm -hmm. you know, love that we have given to your family, the prayers that went on, I think the pastors were praying, mm. obviously your church members were mm. praying also to assist you and so on. But what were the remedies maybe that you were really using during that particular time? Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, for, for my family, what we used to do, we used to, uh, I used to boil a, a lemon with ginger and, and garlic. And then we also put in a little bit of turmeric because if you can read on the paper for turmeric, it's written, it's a natural antibiotic. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was most every morning before we wake up, I will give them. And there's also a black seed oil. My brother bought it for us. Mm -hmm. And myself as an asthmatic patient, I used to have a tight chest, but since then, after using the, the black seed oil, uh, the chest, it's, it's okay. So another thing, it's the, the, the normal remedy, the natural one that we've been using from childhood, uh, like keeping ourselves warm by sitting under the sun and the issue of Vicks and hot water, you cover yourself, you steam yourself, yes. then cover and run to bed. Mm. Lot of things have been sent to us mm. and we tried to use it. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I think it's also very important to know, and this is part of Ubuntu. Mm. We have our natural remedies. We have our ways of uh, healing that we have been using all along. And I think in this project, we call it indigenous mm. herbal yes. medicine. So we definitely have to look at those things and the practices, also the exercises and so on that we no longer do. Mm. Some of these things are just natural and we have to continue doing those things. Uh, I really remember also with uh, Dr. Duplessis, mm. we went to, for a funeral during this period and when we came back, all of us, she sent us a, a receipt. <laughs> of the same uh, mm -hmm. uh, receipt that you are talking about. And then we did steam inhalation three times per day. Mm -hmm. So in the morning when you wake up, you would do the steam inhalation in the afternoon and in the evening. I also hate garlic so much, mm -hmm. but we had no choice but to see that we can also use that. And I'm happy now uh, Dr. Lipster is asking a question. Uh, she would like us to talk more about the connection between belonging and Ubuntu. And I think that can be taken by Prof. Uh, Makubela Nkondo. Please, Prof, just tell us more about the connection between the sense of belonging and Ubuntu. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lobster, for the question. I'm uh, certain that uh, we can contextualize Ubuntu in the concept belonging, because when you talk belonging, you are actually indicating that each and every other human being belongs to the other. I think we should look at um, the theory of Lawrence Kohlberg on moral, the stages of moral development. The stages of moral development that have been cited by uh, Lawrence Kohlbeck um, are also what they call universalizability. That was his theory, where he says, in every community, whether you go to Mongolia, whether you go to Kenya, or where you, whether you go to Wisconsin or Norway, there is a feeling that thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not harm. Even if you are a Christian and a Muslim or any other religious orientation, you belong to the human race, the human race, which is in this context, Abandu, the humanity. So when you talk about cohesion, mutual respect, reciprocating kindness, reciprocating development, mutuality, as well as uh, development equally among all races, you have a sense of belonging to the human race. That is uh, in a nutshell. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Anyone that wants to also add the issue of belonging, murmuring, I think you have experienced it. You belonged in a community. Yes. Yeah. You know, the issue of belonging, it's, I think it's also a, 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 in, in a Christian, a, a mood we can look at when Jesus said you need to love one another as you love yourself. The minute you love one person, you know that we belong to each other. Remember, people, we are interconnected. We belong to each other. There's no me without you, and there's no you without me. So we only have we because together we know we belong to one God. If we can have that faith that we are all children of God, we will be able to take care of each other. But if I still want to say that I am a Shangan woman from Guiani, 
then it means I need to look out the community of Kiyan. But being here in Gauteng today, talking most of the people that are listening, you may find that in my community only 10% were able to connect. But because we belong to the same country, we belong to each other, we are there for each other, we need to reach out to each other. I think the belonging and Ubuntu are inseparable because you understand that you belong and the minute you know that I belong to this community, you'll have to show compassion and love them. Thank, thank you. you. And I saw uh, uh, Dr. Duplessis wants to add something. Yes, thank you, Prof. I also want to add to the be belonging as, uh, of Ubuntu. You know, I'm not from Gauteng. I'm from the Eastern Cape. And during the COVID-19, I couldn't go home. I'm the only one here. I don't have family members here. So I want to bring, show you how Ubuntu, where the sense of belonging come in. Um, and through the COVID-19, from lockdown up until now, until last month, I've lost four family members. And I couldn't go and bury them. But the community in Estres where I am, they make me feel like I'm protected. I have comfort because they give me that love, that caring. Your burden is my burden. Your pain is my pain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Prof Ngunyulu, sense of belonging, you also want to say something? Yes, Prof. From the midwifery point of view, I just want to remind fellow midwives that let's create that therapeutic environment for our patients so that they have that feeling of belonging. They have to know that our midwives are there for us. This is, uh, COVID-19 gave us the opportunity to show our compassion, our love, our skills, to win our patients back. Because listening to stories about midwives really is not nice. So this is an advice to fellow midwives that let's change our attitude and create a therapeutic loving environment for our patients so that they really feel that sense of belonging. When they think of coming to the hospital, they must just run, whether it's 1 a.m. knowing that as long as midwives are there, we are safe. Thank you. Uh, I think there was another question before the one on that stigma, we are currently stigma. seeing. And I think the question was on what can women do mm. to ensure that they deal with a stigma that is gradually becoming associated with this pandemic? A prof? Um, thank you so much. I guess uh, stigmatization is actually a, a phenomenon that affects us in several ways. As you know, when one woman in a KZN for the very first time announced that she was HIV positive, she was killed. I'm sure many people are aware of that girl, uh, Gugu. Mm -hmm. Now, what is very significant here is that to dispel the stigma associated with uh, COVID, we have witnessed, for example, for the very first time uh, in decades, nurses on International Nurses Day. And nurses have the predominance of women, mm. were for the first time so given recognition, respect for the sacrifice that they made. Actually, we saw for the first time how nurses who died from COVID were so appreciated for the first time people realized the kind of contribution they are making. So I don't want to believe that it is mostly women who are stigmatized. There may be some situations, obviously, when, where women are stigmatized. For example, I talked about the example of the idiomatic expression where they say, 
or a woman doesn't burn, which means if somebody has COVID, if you are a woman, obviously uh, you are a carer, a primary carer. So you would be the most susceptible person because you will have to go out and be caring. Obviously you have to care, but you have to be protected mm -hmm. because nobody is immune. Mm -hmm. I think that is the crux of the matter, protecting the women who are primary carers, ensuring that we share the responsibility and that is very significant. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. I think some of the stigma that really uh, people uh, experience was, for example, where nurses were finding themselves having to take a, a, a public transport. Mm -hmm. And then when they come into those taxis, mm -hmm. and then people will mm -hmm. feel mm -hmm. that you are bringing COVID mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. and we don't want COVID. Mm -hmm. But uh, we really, as women, we, uh, I think we have got a role to educate, because mm. as we continue to educate, people will have an understanding, and I think the stigmatization will also not be as rife as we expect. So I think education is, ve is really very important, and I think through media and also through uh, 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 communication, uh, it, uh, people are getting educated about uh, COVID-19. Uh, we have another question that says, what can be done to ensure that we don't lose the attributes of Ubuntu, and sh ensuring that it does not fall into traps of just being a lip service, but something that we live up to on a daily basis? I think this is a very, very brilliant question. Mm -hmm. Because indeed we can sit here and talk about Ubuntu, we can write good, things about Ubuntu. I think what the uh, 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 viewer is asking is, how do we live Ubuntu? And I think that's why we thought of having this uh, sharing session, so that we can be able to also show how people are living Ubuntu. The mere fact that when Mama Ringa was very, his family was sick, and there were people who brought food and so on. That is Ubuntu, and that is living Ubuntu. The, uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Duplessis has just shared with us about what they're doing <coughs> at Esteras to ensure that kids mm -hmm. who do not have food because the feeding schemes have stopped, they are now having a feeding scheme to uh, uh, ensure that those kids have food food. And I think those are some of the examples of Ubuntu. Let's leave it. Indeed, we understand. Let's not only write about it. As midwives and nurses, as we continue sacrificing, going to work every day in an environment that we know that we can contract the infection, that is part of Ubuntu. You are not saying, I'm going to stay at home. You are saying, in the line of duty, my caring, my compassion will continue. And I think this is some of the examples of Ubuntu that we can ensure that we live Ubuntu every day. The sense of belonging, the issue of equipping others, empowerment. When I'm a professor, I cannot be the only professor. The other professors must also pick me mm -hmm. up. We mm -hmm. can give you an example of Ubuntu even in this panel. Mm -hmm. I am a professor because of Prof. Makubela mm -hmm. He, She is the one that supervised me during my PhD. Mm -hmm. Prof. Ngunyulu is a professor because of Prof. Mulauzi. So mm. it's sort of mm. like a, 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 what do they call it? A a vicious circle. Yeah, it's a vicious circle and we are trying to ensure that we are really equipping each other. And I think that is part of Ubuntu and that's one thing that we have to really continue doing as Africans. And here is another question, a very interesting question. And 
Uh, how can healthcare workers take care of themselves during this time where they are overstretched? I think this is also a very important question. Mm -hmm. And Prof. Makuela Nkondo, will you please take this one? You know, um, this is a very critical question. Others were also important. You may recall that uh, Professor Ngunjulu talked about an injury to one is injury to all. Uh, I want us to be very circumspect. A cautionary note is important here because when, I, when uh, we talk about what they call self-emolution, where you want to be umuntu so much that you just throw yourself in a lion's den, uh, that unfortunately cannot happen. We know that we have very few human resources in terms of healthcare professionals. We do not have enough nurses, we do not have enough doctors, and we cannot uh, be romantic when it comes to COVID kills. Mm. So when I say avoid self-emolition, there is the need, one, to make sure that you cannot get into that situation without protective gear. We are aware that doctors and nurses died wearing protective gear. So realistically, we have to take care in such a way that education of the community, education of the extended family, that please, we are dealing with a novel invisible disease that kills. Now there is evidence, according to the World Health Organization, that is being taken seriously because there is strong suggestion that COVID is now airborne. Because they used to say it's not airborne. Now they have come up with convincing evidence that it is airborne. So we must take extra precaution. We know also that during COVID, there has been so many uh, deaths that now we are having orphans of COVID who obviously don't even have grandparents. Mm -hmm. Having said that, what do we do? We do not abandon abandon people, but we take the necessary precaution and we ensure also that we become assertive in a positive manner. Mm. I cannot be romantic and say, oh, my child is COVID positive, hug my child. I cannot do that. I have to live through the pain of being unable to hug my child until such time that my child has gone through the positive stage. The, that is a hard fact that we must accept. Uh, thank you, Prof. I think you have said a mouthful. And I think one other thing that is really very important for healthcare workers, you know, is also understanding that there is also a danger of infecting your own families. Mm -hmm. So I was talking to one of my uh, colleagues who said, every day when I come back, the garage is a place where nobody comes. It's only me that goes into that garage. So when I come back, I have to take off my clothes at the garage. Mm -hmm. I have to make sure that I sanitize, I leave those clothes there so that I then go straight into the bathroom take a, a, a bath and thereafter is then that I can hug my children, I can start talking to them because it is about protecting them as a family. So the family is already used to say, okay, we are not going to be able to talk to her. She has to do one, two, three, four first before we start greeting her. Even the young ones are now used to that. And I think that is really very important. As uh, Mama Ringa has said, it's about protecting others. It's about protecting families. It's also about protecting the community. So I really think there are issues that we definitely have to look at. And indeed, the issue of protective 
personal equipment has been an issue that was really discussed. The nurses sometimes felt like the state is really not providing the quality PPEs as they would want. But really, we, uh, we know very well that the government is busy discussing with unions on ensuring that the quality PPEs are provided for nurses and doctors. We have lost a large number of them. On the 20th of August, we had a prayer day for nurses, where nurses in large numbers came and we were uh, trying to remember those that have passed on during the line of duty and also those that are sick and those that have, are really at the front line. And we, the, that prayer day was also attended by large numbers. Uh, now I would like to hear from uh, Dr. Duplessis mm -hmm. about the issues of, uh, you know, taking a, it takes a village to raise a child. As to what are some of the things that you think can still be done in order to ensure that a project like that doesn't only happen in Esteras, and it also happens in other communities. Thank you, Prof. I think what can still be done there is, like I said, to go back and see what was the impact of the feeding scheme before one start to roll it out to a next community. And you know, what is also important there and what Prof was now mentioning is that people, parents are dying of COVID. Kids are often. So one have to really go and do more groundwork. So the idea here is to go back and really go and adopt. Because remember, I said I work with an NPO. So really to go and adopt a group, those group of children, uh, you have to document their names, you have to track and see uh, also in their performance, because it's not only about making them eat, you have to educate them. You must give them that sense of responsibility. They must own their liberation. So, and then get others on board. Uh, the idea is prof to go to Mamalodi, and get those people that was with us in the Ubuntu workshop, because we have the same DNA, we have the same vision, and roll it out to them, to, and also to empower the women, because what came out of this feeding scheme is that you find if the, the kids is not there, the grandparents will come and come and ask for the food for the kids. Because you know the kids now, you ask, where is Sarah? No, I'm Sarah's grandmother, I'm coming to take the, the food for Sarah. So also, also to go and look at chronic illness and diseases, those grandparents that they are raising those kids, who are they? Uh, uh, and, and look at them also holistically. So, and then roll it out from there. Thank you. Thank you, and I think uh, we are now coming to the closing statements from our panelists. Uh, I will start with you, Prof. We don't have much time, but just a two or three minutes closing statement so that we can wrap up our discussion. Uh, thank you so much. I think the most important thing for women to be agents of change, particularly during COVID, we need to establish whether our education system is able to retain all the young girls so that they can be able to have the necessary empowerment. And the other thing that is very important that uh, uh, is required for, for women to be agents of change is to teach independence because through good education, women can be independent, not without obviously being communal. They can also learn not to conform 
where their lives are threatened. And again, to reiterate the importance of being circumspect, circumspect of taking the necessary precaution so that we never commit suicide by being too idealistic, too romantic. We have to protect ourselves as we care for other people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, Mama Ringa. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, yes, indeed, we need to make sure that as much as we love our families, we love our communities, we still need to follow the protocols that government has put in place. The most important thing is to share the information. If possible, we need to ensure that in communities, we have cadres who will be able to talk to women. It's so painful when you go on the street and you meet people who are still not putting on masks. The main painful thing is that that problem of social distance. If we can win that one very soon, the percent can reach zero because people are putting masks, but the social distance, it's like when we are on a queue, when you do a social distance, someone will come between you and say, I thought the line was ending there. So I think that is the most critical part that most of us, we are failing to adhere to. Let us try to educate our communities. Let us share these experiences like you have created this powerful platform. I think those who managed to listen, they have learned a lot. Even us as panelists, we have gained a lot. Allow me, a Professor, to share you these words by Pope Francis as a words or in closing statement. I'm going to quote him. Pope Francis said, we are one communities. Rivers do not drink their own water. Trees do not eat their own fruits. The sun does not shine on itself and flowers do not spread their fragrance for themselves. Living for others is a rule of nature. We are born to help each other, no matter how difficult it is. Life is good when you, have, when you are happy, but it is much better when others are happy because of you. Let us make sure that we share our happiness, love one another, but live in protection. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we really now going to have amb ambassadors of Ubuntu <laughs> all over as far as uh, Giani. <laughs> so I really think it is very important what you have shared with us. And indeed, uh, to the viewers at home, we are really looking for the ambassadors of Ubuntu for this project. We are looking at, a, you know, we have looked at the urban areas and also the rural areas. We are looking at Limpopo, we are looking at Northwest, and we are really, really looking for ambassadors. We will be working around Gauteng, but we would like to have ambassadors also in the rural provinces so that we can Indeed, Ubuntu, we think that if it comes back, it is uh, going to help us in issues of moral regeneration. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Duplessis. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Firstly, I want to say thank you for this opportunity and thank you for establishing such a platform. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, and I think it means a lot to the women out there. In closing, I just want to say, and this is a cry out to all the women out there, uh, let us be each other's keeper and let us carry each other because even before COVID-19, we already had issues with our, our gender-based violence and um, female abuse and all of these uh, other social pathologies. And even now more with the COVID-19, I think that mostly women, it hit women very hard. 
from those who plant seeds in the farm to provide for their family, those standing on the street as traders to trade every day, um, doesn't matter what they do, COVID-19, their lives will never be the same. And let us stand and up and help each other because we are the anchors of South Africa. And when a woman suffer, all of us, a nation suffer. So let us be each other's keeper. We are not alone in all of this. We are together and together we can achieve much. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Duplessis. Indeed, women are the ones that are carrying a larger, like, uh, they're carrying a load mm -hmm. because of everything that is happening around us. And that's why we still have the saying that is you educate a woman, you educate a nation. And I really think that we definitely have to continuously have opportunities like this where we discuss issues that are really going to empower us as women. Over to you, Prof. Thank you so much, Prof. And thank you for the opportunity to be part of this workshop. From the midwifery point of view, I just want to say, let us empower each other. Let us empower our women so that they know and understand about COVID-19 and whatever type of infections that are still to come. Because once they know and understand, we will be able to fight even the issue of stigma. As our former president, the late Nelson Mandela has indicated that education is the most powerful weapon that we can use to change the world. Now we have to all live according to the new normal. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. And I just want to say, colleagues, uh, there's also uh, Tina Power, who was also part of this panelist. And I think she shared something that really, really, uh, I found that is something that I, 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 I was not thinking of that. It really took me off guard to realize that women are so creative in such a way that they have now come up with this Tupperware text to say, if I'm, going, I'm being abused by my husband and I don't want, obviously he may take my phone and mm -hmm. look at what am I communicating. But if I say Tupperware, then it means that the other woman will, and I don't think he will be suspicious. Mm -hmm. If I say, a hey, prof, okay, I'm coming to take my Tupperware, I think the woman, even if this abuser can find this phone, he will not be able to understand the, what I'm saying to this other woman. Mm -hmm. And I think this is uh, what makes women definitely unique. We are so gifted in such a way that sometimes we really undermine ourselves. We really don't know that we have been given the opportunities to change this world as women. So I really think that is another innovation that came out of this discussion today. And I think that is really very good. And the other thing that she raised was the issue of data. Indeed, there are times that we really don't understand that now the internet is taking over the world. Mm. For us to be able to assist others, buying somebody data is a, a gift, is something that that person will really appreciate. I know that, for example, for the young students that are studying, the university will say, I'm giving you 10 gigs and uh, 20 gigs, and really it doesn't even last. So I just say to the viewers out there, the professionals and working women that are listening, you know, just adopting two or three keys and you give them data every month, it may mean a lot. To our parents who are in rural areas, they don't even know how to buy that data, but sharing and uh, buying them, that could also mean a lot. We can, you can think that it is not important, but it, it is really very important. Uh, I think that question that has been raised about, you know, Ubuntu must not be lip service. Mm -hmm. We are asking to the viewers out there, 
we need ambassadors for this Ubuntu. You have to be able to live it. And I want to tell you it's something that is not really easy. But let us embrace this Ubuntu philosophy. Let us become African again. I know the majority of us stays in gated communities where you don't even know what your neighbor, who your neighbor is. I, this week there was a, a, a couple that came into our gated community. And then they knocked. When they knocked, I even ran around the house. <laughs> Who is this one that is knocking and what, why, what do they want? Mm. Then I went out and then they said, no, we, are, we have just moved next door. Mm. And they had a flower. They just <laughs> said, you know, we are just here to introduce ourselves. Mm. Because it usually doesn't happen. You know, we have lost Ubuntu. Mm. Then they said to me, no, we are coming from Limpopo. And we know that a neighbor, we have to be neighborly and we have to go and ask salt from our neighbor. <laughs> so we felt we cannot just come into this gated community and forget where we come from. So I asked, where do you come from? They say Limpopo. I said, I am India, and I'm also <laughs> from Limpopo. They, but they wear a Northern suit too. So I felt really, this is part of Ubuntu and this is what we definitely have to do. And Ubuntu is also about, you know, not only taking care of your neighbor, but also understanding their needs. Mm. People sometimes don't have to tell you, mm. I don't have food. Mm. You just have to find a way of how do I share food with this particular person. And I think those are gestures that are really very important. COVID-19 came when we have least expected it. For us as nurses, for the, this year was a year of the nurse. We had planned so many activities, but unfortunately those activities also couldn't happen due to COVID-19. So we plan, but God has more plans than, we, than what we are planning. So for me, the last thing that I want to say is for everyone that has watched this uh, session this afternoon, Kindly do an introspection and ask yourself, am I living with the spirit or with the philosophy of Ubuntu? Have I embraced it? Because I'm quite sure that our parents really taught us Ubuntu. They socialized us in that way. But as soon as we go to schools and get qualifications, those qualifications that even alienate us from others. I'm a professor. Now when I'm a professor, do I talk to Bonyam Kamadi? Do I have to go to a, a, a meeting with her? What type of language or debates that will be uh, going on there? Does it suit my status and so on? That is not the way we have been raised. Let us embrace Ubuntu. Let us become African children. Let's really understand what Ubuntu is all about. This is just one of the first sessions that we are going to have. We are still going to have many sessions. Please, re I, I think that we, our viewers, please attend and support us. What we are trying to do here is to bring moral regeneration mm -hmm. to the nursing and midwifery profession. But not only that, we want Ubuntu to be tapered down to the community. We would like a child in grade one to understand that I am because you are. Mm -hmm. You are because I am. And I can only be a person because of another person. With those few words, we just want to thank everyone that has tuned in. I just want to thank my panelists. You really made this very easy. You talk about Ubuntu as if it's something that is easier, but it is good that we leave it and continue to show it to the others so that everyone, if we have a Ubuntu, I don't think we will be faced with 
all these uh, challenges that our country is facing to do today. I thank you. Rolibu Abadi, Wawanarine, Realebuwa, Akensa, Bayadanki, all languages, I think, and all protocols observed. Ah. Uh. Uh. <laughs> At the University of Pretoria's Faculty of Health Sciences, we like to focus on potential. The potential of our students to make a positive difference to the world around them. The potential to produce research that shifts boundaries. The potential to heal, to relieve, to recover and restore. Discover your potential and join the movement. Follow the University of Pretoria's Faculty of Health Sciences on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn to be a life changer.